Welcome everyone um, to tonight's event. I'm, my name is Jeff Lamia, and I'm president of the AIA New York Society. Um, the AIA, is, as for those of you who are members and well know, is actually a very um, active and uh, its mission is to foster the professional practice of archeology span and to uh, reach out to the general public explaining uh, things, newest discoveries amongst archeologists. Um, the New York Society has a whole variety of endowed lectures. Those of you who are members will be receiving our newsletter very shortly. And in that you'll see a listing of all of our uh, forthcoming lectures. Or if you're not a member now, please join. Uh, you can always go to our website, uh, AIA nysociety.org and go to the events page and you'll see all of our lectures for this uh, season. Um, the next lecture, which will be on October 13, um, is going to be Life and Death in a Roman Suburb uh, with Dr. Allison Emerson. And I would urge those of you who are members, please join us uh, at the start of that lecture, which will start at six o'clock on the 13th, where we will have a, the New York Society's annual meeting. Um, there will be a number of things there which needed to be voted on. And as members, you have the ability to do so. You will receive as a member an email with the agenda in uh, shortly. Um, as I mentioned, the New York Society is quite active and one of our major uh, endeavors is our New York Society Scholars Program, which I've spoken about in the past, where we up give to up to six uh, students of archeology span um, membership in the AIA or the AJA if they want it, as well as other benefits. And they become eligible for our fieldwork scholarship, uh, which permits partial funding for defraying their expenses to engage in the field work. We've um, actually awarded three um, field work scholarships. And um, our second cohort uh, will be giving us a short presentation this evening before we begin our main lecture on the field work scholarship that she received. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Joanne Spurza, who is leading this effort. So Joanne, um, I guess I will make you a co-host. Okay, well, thanks, Jeff. And um, a word of, of great thanks really to everyone else on the New York Society board who has contributed to the success of this program. It really has been a group effort. We've been very glad to be able to support New York students with this initiative and at the same time to raise awareness of the activities of the local AIA chapter. And um, to any faculty in the audience, we hope that you'll nominate a student for the next cohort of NYS scholars by October 24th. All the information is on the website. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Rebecca Tauscher who is the scholarship winner from the second cohort of AIA NYS scholars. And Becca received her BA in classical studies and classical archeology span in the spring of 2021. She was a member of the Solomon Bloom Scholars Program, our funded honors cohort for classics and archeology span majors. She graduated with honors, having written an honors thesis on the iconography of the Seven Against Thebes in Etruscan material culture under my direction. This past year, Becca was in Rome as a senior Paideia fellow, working on various Paideia projects and running academic tours for high school students and college students in Florence, Naples, Rome, and Greece. And this past summer, it was back to the Etruscans. She attended her first field school with the support of her AIA NYS scholarship. 
In July, she worked at the cemetery site, the Necropoli del Valone di San Lorenzo, alongside Italian students from the University of Perugia, excavating tombs of Etruscan or Umbrian origin. And this is the experience she'll be speaking to us about for a few minutes now. So Becca, let me turn things over to you and ask you to share your screen with us. Does everybody see a slideshow with the title? Yes. Great, amazing. Um, so this season, uh, due to the receiving the AIA NYS's scholarship as part of the scholars program, I was able to attend the excavation at the Necropoli del Valone di San Lorenzo in Montecchio, Umbria, Italy. Um, I was there for four weeks uh, throughout July. Uh, here you can see a photo of where we stayed. We actually stayed in a sunflower uh, farm and it was quite beautiful. Um, so the site that we were excavating at um, was a, a Umbro Etruscan necropolis that dates between the late 7th and early 6th century BCE to the 4th century BCE. It was first excavated by Domenico Bellini in the mid 19th century and since his discovery of the necropolis over 50 tombs have been discovered. From the maps that you see on screen, you can see the location of the necropolis is just over the Tiber River on the eastern border, right between Umbrian and Etruscan territory. It is just south of Orvieto and about an hour and a half north of Rome. Um, because of this uh, close proximity between the Umbrian and Etruscan people, um, it is believed that there was a mix of cultures happening here. However, because Orvieto, a more powerful Etruscan city, is the closest to the area, it is believed that the site was under Etruscan control, mainly also due to the examples of material culture found in the tombs and the style of tombs that have been discovered on site. The screenshots from Google Maps, you can see a sort of zoomed in picture of where our site was located within the necropolis itself. The blue box is the previous year's excavations, which took place in 2019. And the red box is our excavations, which took place, as I said, just this past July. These pictures give you a perspective of the tomb, uh, sorry, of the excavation site looking left and right towards our different excavation points. To the right, we have tombs R3 and R4, and to the left, we have tombs R5 and R6. In addition to excavating these tombs, there was also a Roman road. However, I was not part of that project, so I do not have any photography pictures of that excavation site. So, the goals of the excavation were to continue excavating in the same area from the previous season of 2019, and actually the previous season of 2017 as well. We were digging in the same area as these two previous projects, and the site had been located by partnering with locals who had been living in the area their entire life and were very familiar with the local terrain of the necropoly, necropolis itself and helped us find tombs previous to our arrival. So upon the arrival of all of the students on site, the tombs had already been located and where we would be excavating had already been determined. As I mentioned, there were four tombs and the Roman road. R3 was a chamber tomb, which I will show a picture of in a short period of time. R4 was a small burial of a mother and child. R5 was a very surprising burial of a horse. And R6 was a very unique type of tomb, a Cassone tomb, which had not been found in the necropolis before. I was able to work at three of these four tombs during my four week time at the necropolis. Uh, mainly the team was split down the middle between half Italian students who accompanied the American students. The Italian students were more experienced than the Americans, so the Americans were offered a chance to rotate amongst the tombs in order to have more of an experience in learning the different methods of the um, archaeological sciences on site, since for us this had been our first experience. Unfortunately, all of the tombs that we excavated had been disturbed at some point in the past, and so we did not find a lot of material culture. My role was, as I mentioned, in three out of the five active trench sites. R3, the chamber tomb, you can see on the left. 
R5, the horse tomb you can see in the center, we were able to recover a hoof from R5 and the hoof will be sent for genetic testing in order to determine the color of the horse, which may give us insight into why this horse was buried. Unfortunately, we ran out of time and we were not able to complete the trench where the horse is. And so if there was more material culture underneath the horse remains to be seen. R5 was the final tomb that we discovered two days before the end of excavation. It was this very interesting Cassone tomb that you can see the outline of on the right. It too had been broken into at some point in the past, the body pulled out to the side and many of the remains disturbed. But we were able to eventually lift the lid. However, this work took place after the American students had finished their time on site. And so it was completed by the Italian students. In addition to work on site, we also did work in a museum, so we were all able to learn skills along cataloging, cataloging items, cataloging pottery, identifying different types of pottery, different um, pieces of pot shirts, whether it was a rim or a body, and then we learned how to draw these things, which would be inputted into CAD software for organizing and cataloging all pieces. We did this with the material culture from the excavations in 2019 since there had been delays in cataloging this due to the pandemic. We worked with a majority, a good variety of materials, both on site and in the museum. We worked with pottery, iron, we worked with animal remains, we worked with human remains, um, and we also um, had a lot of organic material as well on site. I, of course, must give thanks to the team that I worked with. You can see a big group of us above and then some of the missing Italian students who arrived in the second half of excavation below. The director is Professor Gianluca Rassili from the University of the Perugia and Professor Sarah Harvey from Kent University who led uh, the American team. Our site supervisors, Francesco Pacelli and Stefano Spiganti, and our trench supervisors, John Carlo Sandrelli and Flavio Uzzerti, and of course, our driver who picked us up every morning at 5.30, Francesco Cardinali. We faced many challenges together between some people being delayed onto site because of a World War II bomb that had been found on a previous site, so he was delayed coming. We had extreme heat up in the temperatures of 105 degrees Fahrenheit, and we were threatened by forest fires, which forced us off site for two days. But together, we worked very hard together, and it was a really great experience learning not only about excavating, but expanding my Italian skills and speaking in Italian and using vocabulary very specific to the field I wish to work in. Working on site helped me solidify my goals to work with material culture in the future, hopefully in a museum role of some kind. And so I was very excited and very honored to be able to participate in this excavation. Last, I would just like to say thank you to the AIA NYUS Scholars Program for making this possible, and as well to Professor Joanne Spurza, who is here tonight. She was my thesis supervisor and my teacher when I was studying in undergrad and a great inspiration to me and is a big part of why I'm here today. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, um, that's really great. We're very happy that uh, you might unshare your screen now. Yeah. Um, we're very glad that you uh, were able to take advantage of the um, New York Society Scholars Program and the field, winning on the Fieldwork Scholarship. So uh, that's excellent. And uh, the um, Hope that your future in archaeology is a bright one, which from the quality of your presentation and your, your award, uh, it looks like it certainly will be. I definitely so, hope so. Again, congratulations to you. you. So let me turn it now directly to our main lecture, which is um, Dr. Timothy Pugh, uh, who is a professor at uh, Queens College here in New York City in the Department of Anthropology. And uh, he earned his BS in sociology and anthropology from the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. Um, and then his um, MA in anthropology from the University of Memphis and his PhD in anthropology from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Um, in looking over his CV, it's really quite distinguished. He has literally had National Science Foundation grants from 2010, almost every year up to 2021, aside from Wenner-Gren Foundation, which is uh, very big in anthropological research. 
Um, he's uh, currently, as I mentioned, a professor um, at, since 2013 at uh, Queens College and also at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. He has a number of books and monographs. Um, his articles and book chapters, his most, just most recent ones are 16, but they're in a lot of prestigious publications uh, from the Journal of Archaeological Research, Ancient Mesoamerica, several frontiers of political science, Journal of Archaeological Method and, and Theory, the Journal of Field Archaeology, so quite, quite a long list distinguished. He has presented uh, papers at conferences and professional meetings, and there are numerous, obviously, at the Society for American Anthropology, as well as others in New York City, in Rhode Island, in Pennsylvania, Poland, Guatemala, Spain. And he's engaged in field work, not only in Guatemala extensively, but also outside the, uh, in, the term, in numerous places in the US and also included in Belize. So we are very fortunate to have a real expert on the Mayan area. And he will speak this evening about the ball courts of, and I hope I get this right, Tim, in terms of pronunciation, Mishtenchi Ich. Um, so I will now turn it over to him. Now, I guess I will share my screen. Or Kim, can you come in, I guess? I can't, uh, I, actually I can't, it says I'm disabled I'll make, to, I'll to make share you. my I'll make you a okay. co-host, I guess. Um, there we go. Let's see, wait a second. So you should be a co-host now and you should be able to, to get in, I think. Yep, there you go. Thank you very much for the introduction. I, I, just to let you know, none of us pronounced the name right. I think you were pretty close with that. It, it is each for the last part of that. Um, thank you also to the AI uh, Society for inviting me to do this talk, um, and also the, the non-members who are present, you really should join up, and those of you who are undergrads, you should go for that scholarship, or the join, try to get into the uh, fellowship program, because it, one of my students has done it, it's quite, quite a good opportunity. Um, I also need to mention that the, the work that I'm discussing here is not just me, it's, uh, I have managed to get funding for it. Uh, but it's actually part of a larger project and all of the members um, contributed. So what I want to do today, first of all, I have to introduce the site. And so we've spent a bit of time on that. And then I will say, I'll tell you a bit about the ball courts because we have three ball courts at the site. And we've actually done some work all, on all three, although we still have a, a lot of work to go there. Okay, so th let me just quickly mention a little bit about ball courts. Um, first of all, this is the traditional boundary of Mesoamerica. And one of the traits that defines this, this area, this cultural area is ball courts. Um, and there are around 1300 that have been found so far. So, and, and not only that, um, the oldest goes back at 3,400 years ago, and it's actually, the game is still played. So this, this you know, ball court and the institution around it is, is quite ancient. And, and ball courts may be um, the like, longest lasting and most, most extensive um, architectural sort of complex ar architectural form in Mesoamerica. Now I also have to mention that this is not the only place that has ball courts. Oops, it's going the wrong direction there. Um, we, we see that they spread into the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Rico they have ball courts. Um, also to the southwestern United States. Now, in both of these areas, it's a little bit different, but there are some things, for example, in the Caribbean, they wear yokes uh, similar, vaguely similar to the ones in, in the Maya area. In the southwestern United States, they have large ball courts. They found remnants of what appears to be a rubber ball. Um, they've also, well, they, we know we're in, they're in contact with Mesoamerica because uh, we found, find macaws there, you know, the birds, and, and also chocolate. So, Again, they, they're found outside of the area. It's, it's not something that's just limited to Mesoamerica. Now, one thing though, again, they're, they're, they're a little bit different in these areas. And also within Mesoamerica, there's variation. So it's not just, there's not just one set of rules. You know? So you have, always have to keep that in mind because when something spreads, I, I don't know how many of you guys have seen the, the anthropological film, Trobrian Cricket. It's actually quite interesting, but the, the game Cricket, um, was spread to the Trobrian Islands. And the people there reinterpreted the game. It's very different. They, it's, it's, 
we just have to watch it and you know, see what I'm talking about. But basically the idea is that as cultural traits spread, they're reinterpreted by the groups that take them in. And again, I'm gonna focus here mainly on the Maya region. I just want to introduce that really quickly here. It's a Southern part of Mesoamerica. It includes Southern Mexico. It includes Belize, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. And Nishtun Chich, which is the site I'm going to focus on, is, is number one. Of course, that's the way I identified it there, right there in the center of the Maya area. Now, probably the most well known, you know, after maybe Chichen Itza, maybe Copan, but I'm going to use Copan here because it's small and easy to see. Um, Copan has one of the most well known ball courts. And it's uh, the reason it's well known is because it's nicely reconstructed and you can see what's going on there. And you can note here you know, a number of traits. First of all, you can see that the sides are sloped. And the reason that they're sloped is to facil facilitate the game. It's played with a rubber ball, a solid rubber ball. And you know, they don't want it to get stuck somewhere. So they, you know, it, it keeps it active. Another thing you'll notice is there's a plain alley, right? It's not too wide. Um, and then you have end zones. Now this ball court, I would probably call it, although some people may disagree, I would call it a T-shaped because it's open on one side, but uh, th those are actually quite common to have them kind of shaped in the letter T. The ones that I'm going to mention today are shaped in the letter, it's, they're like a capital I shape. So I'll show those in a second. Um, notice, I think I pointed out the markers here. Um, you're gonna see three markers. That's gonna be quite common um, as we go through this lecture. Um, okay, now one thing I want to point out is that this is not just a game. This is this is sort of a combination between a ball game and a religious, it's not just sort of, that's what it was, both a game and a ritual. It's a religious event. And the ball court itself is not a mundane thing. It actually represents a fissure in the earth that goes down into the other world or underworld, whatever you wanna call it. And it refers to the connection between the human world and the spiritual world. Um, it also refers to mythological events at the beginning of time in which the hero twins, they had, like many parts of the Americas, they had hero twins. The hero twins battled the lords of death and they won, although one of them was sacrificed, beheaded, and his head was used as a ball, which maybe, but in the end, he ended up rising again, you know, he was resurrected as the maze god. So there's a connection between the underworld symbolism that I just mentioned and also fertility and maize, which is the prime carbohydrate of Mesoamerica and actually of us today. <laughs> so but anyway, and the important thing is it has strong religious connotations here. Now, another connection here with religion is the rain deity. And on the right, you can see an image of a ball court. It's in cross section. You're looking at it you're, as if you're standing within the ball court. It's not looking from above, it's from within. Uh, here are the edges of the ball court right here. And you can actually see the ball inside of it. And you can see this figure above holding another ball. And this is the rain god. And rain is also tied to the ball courts. And some ball courts are set up so that they catch rain. They, maybe rain will flow through them or they'll act as pools. Okay, so they're also connected to the rain. There's actually a reason for this because a lot of Maya groups believe that rain existed in the underworld. The underworld had water in it. And it came out, it went through mountains and then went to the clouds and then it fell down. And so there's this also this connection that the ball game was necessary to make sure that it rained. All right. So um, again, strong religious um, connections to this. Now, of course, I know some of you have heard that um, that this the losers of the game were sacrificed. I at the, in the courts that I've excavated, I don't have no evidence for that. Um, it most likely happened that it was described by the Spanish, um, um, which it may have happened, you know, in, in certain areas. But again, where, where, where I've been working, I haven't seen evidence for that um, yet. Okay, now, actually, one other thing about this image is that a couple, well, a couple of anthropologists, Andrea Stone and Mark Zinder, um, suggest, they noted that, you know, you're actually looking at this in first person, because it's, when you see this image of this ball court, it's, it's as if you're standing in it. And again, of the, the glyph forts on the left, it's the same image, it's in cross section. If you look at the images of ball courts from other parts of Mesoamerica, it's as if you're above it, you're distant from it. 
And we're not really sure of the reason for this, but it seems that either the artist that produced the, the drawings of Maya Balkors, or maybe the audience that was going to consume the, the, the drawing, um, they were probably ballplayers. They had firsthand information. And maybe in the case of, of the Mexica, which you, you see there on the right, where you see it from a distance, maybe the, the artists were not sort of that familiar with what's going on down in the ball game. All right, so it's a different perception. And actually what I'm trying to get at here is the fact that not only is the ball game different, maybe, maybe even the perception of the ball game is different in different areas of Mesoamerica. Okay, now another convenient fact is that the ball game is actually still played in, in actually Northern Mexico. These are not Maya people, but they, these are people that, that continue the game. And what you can see there, they're actually playing it with their hips and they're, it's a solid rubber ball. Yes, this would hurt um, if you were accustomed to it, um, but um, you know, they still play the game today. And the good thing about this is we, we can actually see how it's played. Um, we can also see that there's variation within the game, even in this particular area. There are different ball sizes. Sometimes they use bats for, with, with smaller balls. Sometimes they um, use gloves but then they have this, fit, this hip variation. And that's one of the reasons I'm showing this picture is because it's believed that in the Maya area, in the large courts, the, with the masonry courts, um, they, were, they were playing the hip game. But another thing to notice here is there's no court there. And this actually tells us something. What it tells us is that in sites that don't have ball courts, it's very possible, maybe even very probable, that they were also playing the ball game. We just don't have evidence for it because one problem with ball courts, and we actually see this in this court, in the modern play, they clean them up very carefully. So it's you know it's possible that we are missing these in a lot of sites. In other words, we're not seeing them. Oh, one other thing I should mention really quickly is the size of that ball that, that you see there is probably the typical size in the time period that I'm going to discuss, which is the pre-classic period, because they have actually found they found a solid rubber ball in a, um, actually it was in a pool of water in the Olmec area, which is just north of the Maya area, dated to 1600 BCE. So and it was the same size as the one you see there. It's about the size of a cantaloupe, but it's again, solid rubber. Now, a lot of times though, you see depictions of the ball being really giant. This is actually a Maya a ceramic vessel. If the ball was actually that big, it would weigh a few hundred pounds, maybe even a thousand pounds. Uh, you're talking about solid rubber there. So this is this sort of maybe exaggeration there because if the ball was that big, they would not survive contact with it if they actually tried to 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 hit it while it was moving toward them. Um, okay, so here's another depiction. I just get, again want to kind of give you a background on the ball court. This is a depiction of a ball court. It's in northern Mexico. It's not in the Maya area, but this is probably our best three-dimensional image of a, of a ball game in play in ancient times. It's the same time period that I'm going to discuss, though, so it's, it's quite um, important. Uh, but you'll notice here on the floor of the ball court, there are three markers. Okay, those are ball court markers. You also notice that the players, you know, they're, they're you know, using their hips there. The ball's exaggerated in its size. Again, that would be far too large to, unless it was, unless there was a technology we don't know about where they put air in it which is possible. Um, but another thing that was actually pointed out by Joanne Pillsbury of the, of the Met is that the audience, they're, they're all, they're excited about the game. You actually see this one figure, if, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but he's talking to the other guy and maybe they're exchanging because sometimes bets were made and so on. So the audience is an important part of the game. This is also true today. You know, it actually when, um, you know, I like to watch, I, I don't like to go to professional games so much, but if I see, I played baseball when I was a little kid, and if I see a, a baseball game being played, I'll go there and sit and watch it for a while. Um, and, you know, I'll yell and things like that. So the audience is actually part of this event. And remember, this is a ritual. So again, um, they would have been part of this, this ritual. Okay, that, now let's go to Nishtun and Cheech. This is a, obviously an aerial photo of the site. And it's actually doesn't include the entire site. Um, but what I want you to see here is that it's partially on a peninsula, but the site actually goes about a kilometer. Um, the the picture is facing to the east, and it goes a kilometer further to, which is about six tenths of a mile, uh, kilometer further to the um, west. Um, here's its location. It's located on a lake. Um, another thing to note here 
is that it's not sitting there by itself. There are actually, at the time period that I'm going to discuss here, which again is the pre-classic period, I'll show you some dates in just a second, um, there were actually subcapitals, and these are sites that all had ceremonial architecture. We haven't identified any ball courts at them yet, but they all had ceremonial architecture. And so there were sort of second level, sort of like, you know, Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States, and then you know, each state has its capital. So it's sort, of, it's sort of like that second level. And we also find even smaller towns, um, third level settlements that didn't have ceremonial architecture. And so the reason I'm mentioning this, this, this hierarchy, is because Nishtun Chich appears to have been a capital. It appears to have been to control this, this area, right, in, in, in the pre classic period. Okay, so that's something I'll talk about a little bit later and try to relate it back to ball courts if we have time. Okay, now here's a map of the site. Um, this is not LIDAR. Those of you who are familiar with LIDAR, it's not LIDAR. We actually just did or had just had a LIDAR survey done and we'll have the results soon. But you can see that the site is gridded, which when we found the site, or actually we didn't find it. Um, I, that's a long story behind it. The locals, <laughs> they showed us where it was. But when we first mapped the site, we realized that it had this grid, which is weird because Maya sites don't have grids. And so, and at the time when we first found this grid, we, it was the earliest known grid in the, at least rectangular grid in the Americas. And um, so, you know, it, it was a big deal because they, they thought that, you know, the, the earliest grid occurred, you know, 500 years after this. Um, but um, later we actually found out that a lot of early Maya sites, even earlier sites had grids. And so it's a well-planned site. Okay, now I, I need to talk about dates really quickly, but luckily I'm only going to give you two, and you just need to keep these in mind, just two sets of dates. Okay, now, first of all, we have the middle pre-classic period. The grid that I mentioned just a minute ago was built initially in the middle pre-classic period over 2,500 years ago, all right? Now, this is the time in which cities were established in the Maya area, in, the, in much of the Maya area. Not, not everywhere, but this is when the first cities began to emerge. But the governments in these cities was different. You know, you've probably seen images of Maya kings and queens and so on. Um, we don't see images like that in the middle pre-classic period. We see evidence of someone doing planning. Someone's in charge, but we don't see the rulers. Those appear a little bit later. And that's in the late pre-classic period, all right? So that it, around 300 BCE, we start to see the first images of rulers. In other words, we see investment of, of uh, resources to glorify these ancient rulers. In the earlier time period, there had to have been rulers. I mean, somebody was in charge. Somebody was designing these sites, but they're not celebrated the same as they are in the later time period. All right, so... That's just one thing to keep in mind, a little bit very different, but I will refer to these two time periods, the middle pre-classic and the late pre-classic. And the dividing line, actually the only number you really need to think about is uh, 300 BCE, that's what separates the two. And so you have before that and after that. But even so, uh, let me note that there were people at Nishtun Chich before that. So you can see that we have some radiocarbon dates from their remains and people, they were there afterwards though, as well. However, there was a, brief abandonment of the site right after the late pre-classic period, um, which I'll refer to a little bit later. Okay, so th that's the late pre-classic period there. There's some of our dates. Okay, here's an image of the grid. Um, and so it's a, basically a gridded layout of streets in, in, intersecting at, at almost right angles, not quite, because instead of forming rectangles, this grid forms um, trapezoids and they fit together really nicely. It's actually bilaterally symmetrical. Someone did some heavy planning. I don't even, I don't know if I can do this with the machinery that I, I map with. And they use strings. <laughs> they didn't have compasses. So we have no idea how they did this, but it's pretty impressive. Now, one thing about planning though, is this, if you plan a complete city, it's destructive. And so when they built this city, they wiped out almost everything that was there before. And if you if, actually, here's an image of uh, Manhattan when they were putting in the grid. And what they did is they planned the grid out and then they just laid it out. You know, it didn't matter what was there. I mean, if, if the street's supposed to be there, it went through it. And they were, luckily they didn't, they were supposed to build the, the grid through Central Park as well. You can actually still see the spikes in some of the stones, 
but luckily they didn't um, take it that far. They, they left that um, ungridded. Again, th this is an act of power. If someone has the ability to do this. Okay, now another thing at Nistu and Cheech that we uh, can observe is the axis urbis. This is just simply a line that defines um, the center of the site. Now this line is formed by a, a 25 buildings, 25 temples actually, in a row, perfect row. Um, and um, it extends two miles. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's quite impressive. This is another level of planning. All right, and so again, most of, I'm gonna to refer to some ceremonial buildings a little bit later, and you'll see that they're all in a row, but what's not in this row are ball courts. Okay, now just, just briefly, just for a few seconds, I wanna take you um, in the drone and just fly, because I want you to see what the site actually looks like. And if you take a look, um, you can see these little paths running down the sides. I don't know if you can make them out. That's where cattle walk. And the cattle, obviously, they don't know where the street grids are, but they are walking down ancient streets. Why are they doing that? Because it's the easiest place to, to walk. And when I first came to the site, when we didn't know that there was a grid there, we were also walking on the, on the streets because the cattle had cut paths. My point is, is that the grid is still dominating sort of people's actions. You know, it's, it's controlling how they move through space, you know, even though we, you know, the cattle obviously don't know it's there and we didn't know it was there. So again, it's a, it's, it's a very strong, has a strong impact on how people move through space. Um, just a few more seconds with this. Um, don't have a lot of time for it. If you want to, if you actually have a video of the complete fly through the site, if you want to check that out. Um, but you can see this is us excavating. I'm actually sitting there under that tent with the rest of the crew. Um, I think it was lunchtime. This is an astronomical group, and I'll refer to those in just a minute. So I have to cut it there. So let's move on to some, some other information. Okay, now, three architectural groups that are along this line, this axis urbis, are referred to as E groups. And these are astronomical complexes. They're places where the sun and maybe other uh, celestial bodies were observed. And um, these are very characteristic of the middle pre-classic period, remember before 300 BCE, but they actually occur much, much after that as well. Um, so here's what they look like. Um, this is not from Eastern Cheech because uh, we haven't excavate, completely excavated ours, but this is from Tikal, which they, they have completely excavated. And you can see what, what they include on the Western side is a temple with four stairways. This represents the center of the universe. And on the Eastern side, you get up this long platform and you've got three buildings on top, right? Right, that's what it looks like from above. All right now let's look at, look at it from, from actually what the buildings look like. This is a different site, but this is a completely excavated Western building, the building with four stairways. And you can see that it has these monster heads on it. And they're actually mon monsters slash gods, uh, powerful beings on this, these stairways. Um, this is E7 Sub, a famous building from Washak Tomb. And then here's the Eastern structure. And you can see, uh, actually it's kind of confusing because there aren't just three, there are five, but the buildings I'm talking about are here. One, two, three. And again, they're on this long, low platform. And this acts as uh, solar observatory. Now, not all E groups function well. Actually, the ones at Nishtun and Cheech are, they're not calibrated properly, but the one at Washak Tomb does seem to work. And the way it works is this. During the two equinoxes, which is actually one of them is today, right? And it's September 22nd, and then March 20th, the sun will rise above the central building. If you're standing on top of the building that has the four stairways. All right, now during the summer solstice, it will rise above the northernmost structure on that long, low, long platform. And then during the winter solstice, of course, it rises above the southernmost structure. So this, these, this complex actually records, when they function properly, it records the movement of the sun throughout the year, the, the, the rise of the sun. Okay, so it actually establishes a solar year. Okay, I just have to mention one other building here. It's a triad group. It's the largest building at the site. 
Um, it's a massive temple. Uh, it has three structures on top of a large platform. Here's the largest here. It's on the eastern side, and it's flanked by two other buildings, and it represents a hearth. This is a hearth that I was walking. Uh, I went to the, the cowboy's house on the ranch, and he had this three stone hearth there. And I quickly pulled out my camera and asked if I could take, take pictures of it. He, I think he thought I was crazy because it's just a fire pit. But uh, it, this is a very traditional style hearth, a fire pit. Uh, but this one, of course, is, instead of stones, it's got cinder blocks, but it's the same principle there. And that's what this building represents. It re represents the hearth of creation, the place where the the gods established the center of the universe. Another thing to note here is this is late pre-classic. This is when the kings began to emerge and the, the monarchs and so on. Notice how restricted that space is. It's, it's very elevated, so this plaza here, and not everybody would have been able to go up there. It's a very limited space as opposed to the e-groups. They have really large spaces. And so this would have been more restrictive. It would have sort of, it represents the social inequality that was occurring at that time. Okay. Now, last bit of planning I need to mention before I get into the ball courts themselves is pools of water, artificial pools. The Maya would take, they would actually take advantage of natural um, groundwater flow and capture the water in pools. And dear, each year during the rainy season, they would fill up with water. And actually some of them still do. And so you can see one right here. Um, you know, it's, it's filled with water there. So it's along the axis. Actually, there are two of these pools along the, the central axis of the site. All right, so this, this is a, a little reconstruction of that. And so what you can see here in the foreground, Fosa V is the pool that I just showed you. Now it is, you know, as I mentioned, on the central axis, on the axis urbis, right? And there are two other pools of water that are a perfect right angle to these two, all right? It's at 90 degrees. And the reason for that is, is these two are along the axis and then the other two, and actually this one as well, is along this street. And this street is perfectly perpendicular with the axis urbis. Again, this is heavy planning we're talking about here. Now there's another um, located a uh, little bit off of the sort of straight line there, but you know, if you look at the distance between them along this street, they are exactly 155 meters. Now I use the metric system for my archeology, span but that's about a little bit more than 155 yards. But they're 155 yard, meters from each other, right? And so they're evenly spaced. There's some systematics going on here. Now, another thing that we see is that the distance between the center of Fosa V, which is the one that I pointed out earlier, and another one along the axis is around 700 meters. And if you divide 700 by, um, by 155, you get 4.5. Now, what does this mean? Why am I telling you these numbers? Basically, that means we may have found a standardized unit of measurement. And it's somehow related to 77.5 meters in modern measurement systems. Okay, so we're talking about, again, another system of sort of organization of control of space. Okay, now despite, I've just mentioned three different forms of organization, the grid, right, that's strong planning, the axis urbis, again, planning, and finally, this other little system. Oh, and one thing I should mention is that some of these foses, these pools, are covered up by later buildings, all right? So they're actually some that we don't know about. Okay, so actually, we found one of them at least, but some of them are underneath other buildings. Um, but anyway, so we have three different things that have been highly organized, but we have no evidence of who was doing the organizing. We have no evidence of rulers. We know that they had to exist, but we, we don't see them. Okay, and so what does this have to do with ball courts? Well, some theorists have suggested that when monarchs did emerge, they did so in connection with the ball court tradition. They think that maybe they facilitated it in order to, to increase their own power. Now, I don't totally agree with this, but I'm testing it anyway. And that's why we're working on the ball courts because we're trying to figure out if there is any evidence, which we haven't found any yet, any evidence of a connection between these early ball courts and, and divine monarchies. Now you may think, well, mo well, ball courts are just a game. Actually, no, they're not. Uh, ball courts are, it's one of the things that we find in early societies that help to, to bind people together. And if I have time, I'll talk more about that later. 
Okay, so here are our bulk. Can everybody see all of those? I think they're all visible. I don't know if we can move the, um, the little pictures there. But here's the location of the three ball courts at the site. And notice that none of them are located along the central axis. Okay, and here's the, the main ball court that I'm going to mention, talk about today. And what you can see is that it's an I-shaped ball court. It looks like a capital I. And it's formed, again, I mentioned this earlier, but it's formed by at two end zones, the plain alley, right? That forms that capital I. So that's an I-shaped ball court, very typical. It used to be thought that this was a later type of ball court, but obviously we've got it in the, in the, in the pre-classic period, so they occur fairly early. Okay, now if we look at the, the three ball courts at the site, two of them are I-shaped, and actually the later one, which is opposite of what is typically thought, the later one's not I-shaped. Now I'm not going to talk about ball, ball court number two because it's actually dated to the classic period. It's after these, these two that I want to focus on today. Okay, so ball court one is the largest, and then ball court three is a smaller one that I'll, if we have time, I'll tell you a few things about that. Okay, so ball court number one. This, this ball court is the second largest known ball court in Mesoamerica. If anybody knows of another one, let me know. But, but according to the figures I have, it's the second largest after Chichen Itza. However, at the time that it was used, it was the largest because the one at Chichen Itza was built during the classic period. Um, this ball court is 140 meters, which is 459 feet long. In other words, it's longer than a football field. And 27, the, the alley that you see there is 27 meters wide. Now, I want to show you just one of our excavations. I don't want to go into all the excavations. We've actually done, we've actually done quite a few on the, the, these buildings. But I want to show you some that are kind of the most telling. First of all, we've got this trench that we did. It actually went all the way to the other side. But I'm going to talk about this, this part that I've defined here in red. Here you can see what it looks like when it's excavated. Now, I don't, I don't know what it looks like to, to people who are not field archaeologists, but it's, it's actually fairly well preserved, despite the fact that it's not perfectly preserved, uh, given that, it's, that what you're looking at there is around at least 1,800 years old. Um, it's very well preserved. But what you can see there is, first of all, this flat part is plaster. This is the plain alley. This is the, where they're actually playing the ball game. Next, you can see that the edge is sloped. Right. This is remember I mentioned that before we we looked at Copan. We saw that it has a sloped edge. Another thing you can't see is that these rocks behind this sloped edge they're also sloped. Okay, so it, it's incorporating all those elements that I mentioned before. Um, if you look in the back, the, this back wall back here is also sloped. You know, this is a cross section. Um, so what you what you can see here is the plain alley um, down here at the bottom. And then the sides of the building. Okay, this is a very this is the archaeological drawing. This is something we use quite a bit. And so let me just quickly talk about this area in the plain court. We excavated down to bedrock there. And what we found there is that the, the plain floor had been rebuilt at least seven times. Right. So they they built and the, these plaster floors last a pretty long time. But they built, you know, one on top of another, you know, as they re, you know, maybe after five years they they put a new surface on it. Um, you can see this is actually a, a guy named Davy Sandoval, and he's the guy who ran this part of the excavation. And he's drawing the, that's the drawing you see there. Another thing I want to point out is the these rocks that are, you can see in these drawings. Um, this was actually problematic because when we were excavating, you know, archaeologists are good at excavating, but there's some things that are simply impossible to excavate safely, and this is one of those things. The fill of this ball court is loose rock, and so we have to be really careful. There's some places where we, where we start digging and we just have to stop because the, the, these rocks could, could collapse and it's, again, quite dangerous. Okay, so here's what the, the ball court edge would have looked like at one point in time. There's, there's actually, if you look really closely, there's a floor that occurs above what I've drawn here. But at one point in time, its edge would have looked like this. Again, they use slopes to make sure that the ball stayed in play. Right, that's why you have those sloping edges. It's the only place at the site that where we see sloping edges in um, buildings. All right, sometimes we see them in platforms, but um, 
Again, it's very rare in other constructions. Okay, now this is late pre-classic, right? This is the time period, again, when we expect, you know, the, these uh, divine monarchs to emerge. But below that, we have Phil from an earlier time period. And this is worth mentioning because it's possible that this Valcourt actually predates the late pre-classic period. This is actually quite important because if it does, if it pre and if it also predates the divine monarchs, then this means that the, bon the Valcourts actually came first. They're not correlated with the monarchs. And this is not, I mean, actually, this is what I expect to happen because what I expect is that when monarchs did emerge, they did what a lot of monarchs did is they basically started to appropriate things that already existed. In other words, they started to put their monuments into existing architecture. And ball courts are probably one of those things. So this is what kind of what I expect to happen. But we'll see, we're not, we can't say anything solid yet because we actually do not know if this was a ball court at this time. We know that there's a building there at the, in the middle pre-classical period, but maybe they just built a ball court on top of something else. And so we have a lot of work to do before we'll figure this one out for sure. Um, last thing about this drawing. Oh, below the yellow area, there are earlier materials that predate. They probably go back to 1000 uh, BCE there. Okay, now one thing I want to mention, you see that little bump there on the, the landscape between the, the uh, two, um, within the alley, that is a Volcourt marker. It was actually on the surface when we first um, arrived at the site. And here you can see it's there on the left in this picture. And you can see that's a big rock. It's a circular stone. It's cracked because it's been burned over probably hundreds of years. It's been burned over and over again as people practiced slash and burn agriculture, which is where they, they'll, they'll you know, chop trees down, then they'll burn them, they'll plant their crops, then they'll leave and come back you know, a few years later and do the same thing. So if there was an inscription on this, it's long gone. It's, you know, it's possible though, remember I mentioned that there are often three markers, it's possible that there are two more and we're, we're going to look for those um, in the coming years. Um, maybe one of those is inscribed. But actually, that's not why I'm showing you this picture. I'm showing you this picture because you can see that the marker is sitting on top of a class on the plane floor, right? That's not where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be, I don't know if you guys, can you guys make this out? There's a circular uh, place here where there's no plaster. Okay, that's where the ball court mark marker was before, All right? That's actually proper location. It was embedded in the floor. Someone has dug it out and moved it over there, all right? Now, why would they do this? Well, here's the thing. The reason we wanted to excavate the ball court marker is to, to look underneath it to find out whether there were caches. And what those are, they're offerings that are made to activate the ball court, to bring it to life. Now, this is, may sound kind of weird, but just imagine that if you're playing baseball and maybe under you know, the home plate, they put a special offer in there, you know, some, some pieces of jade and uh, I don't know, maybe a miniature baseball bat, I don't know, and put them there as an offering to the gods to activate the court, to bring it alive, to make it lucky, who knows what. But the point is, is they they put special offerings in the court to essentially connect it to the spiritual world, right? And actually, particularly with the underworld. Now, I don't know if you guys recall this, but earlier I mentioned that the, at the end of the late pre-classic period, the site was abandoned. And what we think happened is when they abandoned the site, they took out the offering and they probably took it somewhere and burned it and destroyed it. Now, why would they do this? Because they wanted to kill this ritual space. And this is really common. When sites are abandoned, we frequently see that the, that the people will take out, the, 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 they'll desacralize their sacred spaces, right? They'll, and then they ritually kill them. All right, so this is what, a ritually killed ball, ball court marker looks like. Okay, so um, yeah, it's a terminated cache. Okay, now how am I doing with time here? I think I'm okay. If uh, if, if I go too long, just start waving your hand and I'll, I'll stop. I'm not sure exactly when I started here. Um, okay, so one other area that I would like to mention here is Bosa I. This is one of those pools that I mentioned earlier. Now, when I first came to the site, I actually saw horses drinking there. There, were, there, there was a pool of water there. And I, the landowner, I talked to him, and he said, well, I used to swim there. You know, it was, it was deep enough to swim in. And so, but it no longer fills with water. And we don't know why, but I think that probably somebody, when they, building, they were building a road nearby, 
maybe they they messed up the the groundwater and so but it no longer fills but the good news is then we can excavate it because it's not going to be saturated with water okay so we we excavated into this pool we actually did a lot more excavation than what i'm showing here and i'm just going to show you just one of the smaller excavations and what we found is in the bottom of it um there were floors and so these remember i mentioned before that they prepared their pools they set them up to contain water so this is sort of like the bottom of a swimming pool but it's a special plaster that they put in the bottom to, to contain the water um, in addition um, when they were sort of done with this pool they filled it up with a lot of trash now it wasn't just regular trash it was actually included really large pieces of ceramic um, animal bones jade there were pieces of jade that were generally smashed so there were a lot of really nice items that were thrown into this thing when they when they were finished using it okay another thing about this pool is that there were special caches those those ritual deposits that i mentioned earlier with that put spiritual energy into the ground there were actually some still sitting in there when we excavate this is just this pit that i'm showing you here is only it's like a yard by a yard in size it, it goes down about a little like three and a half yards deep but you know it's a, it's a fairly small pit. But at the same time, we found a number of caches in it, and here are some of those. You can see in the upper left corner, there's a ceramic vessel that's turned upside down. This is very common for ceremonial deposit in this time period. Um, then down here, you can see some some little pendants we found that were in association with this vessel, and we also found complete deer antlers which are very rare because usually they would use the antlers to make tools out of and so the antlers are actually really important because they're also correlated with the rain, rainy season and so this these offerings were primarily placed there they're, they were for you know ensuring rain because the you know the, the, the these little pools would fill with water during the rainy season oh just one last artifact i want to show you there um this, uh, th this is a roller stamp. Actually, let me mention all of these artifacts. First of all, here are some of the ceramics that we found in one of the fossas, um, a lot of animal bones in one of the fossas, uh, jade, as I mentioned earlier. But we also found roller stamps in the fossa next to the ball court. All right. And what that is, it's sort of like a, a cylindrical seal. Actually, it's just like a cylindrical seal that you, you see in uh, the Near East. But these are made of ceramic, or some of them are made of stone. But essentially what they what they do is they, they you can take them and put ink on them, which we know that they used ink for these things, and you can roll them out, right? And it, it produces a design. Sometimes it's abstract, but sometimes it produces what something we that looks kind of realistic, like this serpent head uh, that it was in one that we found in Fosa I, which is the one the, the pool next to the ball court. Um, and this is actually really important because these roller stamps, we don't really know what they were used for. Um, they may have been used to put paint on bodies. They may have been used to put paint on textiles. We don't know because none of the paint has preserved. We found traces on some of the roller stamps, but we've never found what they were marking with. I would say it's probably bodies, I would think. It's probably the people would decorate themselves with these during ritual events. But the important thing is that where we found these things, besides, you know, in, in ritual trash piles, like, like we saw with Bosa I, we find them in burials of emerging elite. In other words, not in royal tombs, but in people that are fairly wealth, wealthy early on. So it's possible. And again, I, I'm trying to argue, remember earlier I mentioned I didn't think that ball courts were connected with elites, but I still have to consider the other side. Of the, you know, maybe they, they were associated with elites because this could be you know, evidence of elites participating in the ball court. But again, we have a lot, we need a lot more evidence to be able to say anything about their participation. Okay, again, I don't know how I'm doing with time. Um, let's see how we're doing here. I think I'll go ahead and sum up. I'm a, sorry. Little while, a little while longer, please continue. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll tell you about the other, the other ball court then. Okay, so the other ball court is located, remember I showed you the big triadic group? It's located just to the south of it. And it's kind of interesting because we see a similar configuration at Tikal. Um, but... It's between the third and we've actually named the streets after they're actually not after New York streets it's after Guatemala City streets, but it's between second and third street. Um, and it's located right here. 
Now this ball court is around 50 meters long, about you know, 50 yards, it, it, but it's really narrow. The, I've actually kind of exaggerated the width here in this picture. It's actually around four meters wide, which is you know, two body lengths wide. Um, its edges though were sloped. And that's, and you can see here, this is our cross section. And this ball court, just like the other, is dated to the late pre-classic period, but just like the other, we've got evidence of some other constructions from an earlier time period. But we, again, just like the other ball court, we don't know if it was a ball court yet. We need to do more work to figure that out. Let me just show you one last thing here. Um, it, it also had sloped edges, and this is the only place we only saw this in ball courts. They cut the edges. What they, what they do is, and that's the reason I'm showing this shot, is because they would place these nice soft limestones in the ground. They were probably square when they put, first put them in the ground, and then they, they shaped them you know, to be sloped. And so this is the, the edge of that other ball court. Uh, and again, they're sloped. It's, it's a defining characteristic. Okay, so let me just sort of try to sum up here. And I guess that the question is that, that you know, I want to sum up with is are ball courts a serious thing to study? Actually, particularly with my project, we're, the main focus of our project is political power. We're trying to figure out who's doing all this designing. But again, the reason we're looking at ball courts, it, one of the reasons is to, to look to see if, in fact, are they associated with divine rulers? But there's actually something else. And that's that ball games are not simply a mundane thing. Ball games are actually important. All games are important. And ancient um, game playing is actually re related to the emergence of cities. And I'm not just talking about in Maya area, I'm talking about in no numerous places throughout the world. And I don't know if you guys know about Dunbar's rule. And, and the, the rule is, is that most people only know, or this is a psychological, apparently, sort of almost law, not, not, not totally a law, but it's, it's a pattern. Um, and Dunbar's rule states that most people only know and trust around 150 people. Now, I'd say my number is a bit lower than that, but the minimum is around 150 people, right? So how can we have cities emerge early on if people tend to only trust a small number of people? And the way that happens is they do things together. Okay, now what we see early on at places like Stonehenge, Gobekli Tepe, and other early ceremonial areas is that people come together, they practice, they exchange goods. You know, that's a, something that brings people together. In order to exchange something, you've got to have some uh, exchange partner, right? And so they exchange goods, they practice rituals together, they have big feasts, and they also also have contests, games, right? And so games help to unify people. You know, they, and, and, and you know, the thing about this is that they don't just unify people, they also allow conflicts to be played out, you know, in games. Um, another thing about games is that they allow, they provide people with esoteric knowledge. So they can talk to each other. Oh, do you remember when that person did that? And, you know, it's sort of like, you know, do you remember when they hit a home run? You know, same sort of thing where you can discuss. And then, you know, I don't know if, I don't really follow sports, you know, even though when I was a little kid, I played baseball. But if I hear people talk about sports, they'll talk about all these statistics. I have no idea what they're talking about, even though I used to play the game. And uh, so that's esoteric knowledge. Some two people can sit down at a bar and start talking about ball players in this language, you know. And so, and it, you know, it, it is a point of commonality. And so the point is, is that of course there's gaming in ancient cities. It brings people together. It it helps to sort of nullify. That Don Dunbar's rule. In other words, it, it helps people to create, you know, break through boundaries and connect to each other. And I just want to, I want to end with sort of a cheesy reference to Kevin, a Kevin Cosner uh, movie, um, Field of Dreams. I hope this is okay. I think it's been long enough after Waterworld that I can do this. Um, essentially in Field of Dreams, which I actually like that movie quite a bit, um, he created this ball court, this, this baseball court that bent time and evokes dead heroes and ancestors. But more importantly, it brought people together. So again, games are more than just passing time. They actually unify people and that's, you know, they create social bonds and that's probably you know, one of the reasons we see them in a lot of early cities. But so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. So if there, if there are questions, please put them in the chat and um, Tim will be able to answer them. While we're waiting, Tim, any ideas to the size of the population of, of the site? That's a good question because I, I'm a real big skeptic with population estimates, but I estimate around 8,000 people, but that is simply based on the size of the site. 
The problem is, is that if you actually look at the architecture, um, they have so many ceremonial buildings, you just wonder where people would have lived. And it's, it, we expect that a lot of them live right outside on the edges, you know, not in the ceremonial core, but uh, some, you know, we're just now working on the, the residential architecture. We do find some residences within the core and they're probably, I mean, they're citizens of the city and they, they probably have a slightly higher status. But again, I estimate around 8,000. And so when we talk about urbanization, you know, when New Yorkers hear 8,000, it's like, no, that's not so many. But when you, when you just imagine in ancient times, there, there's no, you know, running water. There's no, there's no, well, actually they did have uh, very crude uh, drainage systems, but um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, 8,000 would be quite a large number of people to fit in one small area. And while we're waiting in case people have other questions, unless I, I at least I think I've read in the past that um, the Maya would build, for example, temples. Actually, I've experienced this in uh, Mayan and other places in Mexico, but they would build temples on top of each other. Mm -hmm. so, so when you went through, you could actually see previous um, uh, temple complexes and they would then build one on top of the other. Could that be also related to the the layers of the ball court? Yeah, the, the all the buildings that I showed you, and actually that's um, that's something I, I probably should have done an earlier lecture where I just talked about the site, but I want to bounce back here. Just, oops, oh, here, that should be in this picture. And if you look at this temple complex, um, I think if you can see this, this one in the center, this is the triad group. We excavated down into it and we, we went down about, I think seven meters. And we found probably 10 different buildings inside. Right? Mm -hmm. So essentially when you see, when, you know, if you look at this map, it, it's, it, it, it's kind of a lie because it's, 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 it doesn't tell you anything about history. You know, this, this is the reason, this is what it looks like in modern times. But if you, if you were to strip away all of the, I don't know, stuff from the late pre-classic period and, and after, it would look very different, but you'd still have the city grid. But yes, you're very right that the, the ball court underneath their, their, their earlier constructions, but we just don't know what they were. We haven't figured out yet whether or not they're ball courts. And it's possible, it's possible they are, but they could be some other ceremonial building. Well, uh, all righty. Um, there's one comment in the chat. Are multiple ball courts normal to be found at capital cities? Well, I don't know if it's normal, but for example, in Tikal, which is a later capital city located actually about 30 miles away from um, Eastern Cheech, um, they have a number of ball courts. And so I guess your answer is maybe. It's, it's some sites you do see them, but there are some Maya capitals where there are no ball courts. But again, remember they could be playing the game you know, outside. But, but yeah, actually one, one of the reasons that we think that or one of the defining characteristics of Nishun Chich as a capital is first of all, its size, it's massive compared to anything else near it at this time period. In addition, it has three ball courts. It's got three triad, uh, three uh, E groups, and then it's got the triad group. And so um, none of the other sites have anything nearly that much, but yeah, you're, it, it could be related to being a capital city. We have another question here. Is there a relationship between ball courts and adjacent pools? I, thought that was I think so. I think, and again, I was sort of, I, I was sort of rushing, um, but the ball court, for example, this big ball court here, um, the pool was located right there. I, can you guys see my cursor? Yeah, yeah, we can. I, okay. And so I think that the ball court was in fact centered on the pool. It, it was it was definitely related. But the problem, the, the, the big problem is that the materials in the pool are middle pre-classic. They're earlier than the main construction of the ball court. And so, you know, in other words, you know, there's kind of this this disconnect. We don't we don't find hardly anything from the late pre-classic period, which is the time of the ball court. Um, but anyway, to answer the question, yes, I think that there, there is a connection. I think that this ball court was put there to, you know, in association with this pool. I also think that it was put sort of at the front gate of the city because this is a, a, an entrance into the urban core. And so you know, maybe if you had people that you didn't really trust that much, you'd play games with them out here. Um, but it's also, remember I mentioned before, it's a way of connecting. So it's 
like a gate into the social network in the city. But the ball court down here, the second, it actually water probably flowed through it. It, it water probably flowed along this street and went down through this ball court. But we haven't, I haven't documented that yet. So I, that, that, that's a possibility, but I, I think it probably did. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Timothy. Tim, it was very excellent. Lots of interesting stuff, and there's so much interesting, and many interesting things going on in the Mayan areas these days. Um, to everybody, apologize for the mix up on some of the initial uh, technology, um, but um, I want to thank again our speaker for the evening, Dr. Pugh, and uh, we hope to see you all. Please keep in mind. October 13 is our next meeting, uh, which is Life and Death in the Roman Suburb. And before that, we'll have our New York Society Scholars Program. So everyone, I, I would say thank you. And I hope you enjoyed the, the, uh, the program. <laughs>